21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Shooting where? Well, who's shooting? Well, are there police officers there? Yeah. Well, where are you? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Don't worry about it. I'm sending more officers over there. That's right. They're on the way, okay? Okay, thanks. Twenty-first Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I had finished my night tour at 8 a.m. and was not due back on the job for 24 hours. A precinct commander's duty chart is arranged so that there's at least one captain on the job in each division at all times. He reports for his day tour at 8 a.m. and is on the job until 6 p.m. Then, normally, he is off duty until the beginning of his night tour at 4 o'clock the following afternoon and works until 8 o'clock the next morning. But on duty or off, the precinct is still the captain's responsibility, and he is subject to call by the desk officer in the event of any major crime or unusual occurrence. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred in the precinct until 10.18 p.m., when Detectives Novak and Fitzpatrick of the 21st Squad, who had been investigating an apartment burglary, were returning to the station house, heading downtown on Lexington Avenue. So, what good is a manager without a team? That's not the point. The point is a good manager has to have a chance to build a good team. You can't expect a guy like Dressen to come into a club like Washington and build a pennant winner in one year. He's got to have a chance. He's got to have a chance to build the young players up and make a team out of them. Now listen, when the light changes, take a right. I want to stop by that delicatessen and show them a few pictures I'm carrying. Oh, George's? Yeah, there have been some delicatessen stick-ups down in the 15th, too. I had some mug shots pulled on a couple of boys they think might be right for them. I'd like to have George take a look at them. Okay. You take a guy like Dressen. Yeah. What's he going to do with Washington in one year? He didn't perform any miracles out there with that Oakland, California team in one year. Fitch. Did he? What? Hold it here. What's the matter? That looks like Dutch Soaker. Who's Dutch Soaker? He's that friend of Harvey Brider's. Oh, yeah. They parked the car. There he goes into that barn grill. Hello, Dutch. Yeah. Oh, hi. How have you been? How have you been? Oh, I can't complain. Let's see, where do I know you from? Where do you work out of the... 21st Squad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. Now, you should. Now, let's go sit in the booth over there. I want to talk to you. Well, I just ordered a bottle of beer. Well, you can drink it in the booth. Yeah, I guess I can. Hey, listen, can I have that beer when it's taken in the booth? Okay, it's coming. How about one for you? No, no, thanks. Can't give it to you till I take the cap off the bottle. I just wanted to move to the booth. Uh, 35 out of a half. Ah, forget it, huh? Some for you? No, uh, not right now. Come on, Dutch. Yeah. You, you sure you, uh, you won't have something? No, no, not right now. Sit down. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's uh, nice running into you. I didn't just run into you, Dutch. Oh, didn't you? A call came over for us to ring in. Oh, yeah? Uh, this is my partner, Detective John Fitzpatrick. Dutch Soak. Hello. How are you? Move in a little bit, Dutch. Yeah, sure. I better ring in first. Yeah, go ahead. I'll be right back. Can we, uh, we order him something? No, I don't think so. Where are you living now, Dutch? Well, it's still the same place, sir. Where's that? 619 St. George Street. In Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah, in Brooklyn, yeah. What are you doing up here? Well, you know, I, I just come up to see a friend. Where is he? 
Well, I've seen him already. I, I, I just thought I'd, I'd stop in and have a beer before I got the subway home. Where you working? The same place, you know. Truck terminal. You working steady? Yeah, sure. Every day. What do you hear from Harvey? Harvey? Well, I, I didn't hear anything from Harvey. Well, he broke out nearly a week ago. You mean he hasn't been in touch with you? No. No, he hasn't been in touch with me. Why would he get in touch with me? I thought you were such good friends. Oh, listen, you guys got the wrong impression. We weren't good friends. We just knew each other, that's all. I had a beer or two with him once in a while. I, I don't see where that makes us such good friends. I'm having a beer with you. That doesn't make us uh, bosom buddies, does it? Not necessarily. Sure. Hey, I had another flat burglary on Madison Avenue. Yeah? Whitey wanted us to take the squeal. I told him we were tied up. Okay. He's giving it to Woods and Vitale. Move over, Dutch. Yeah. <sighs> Dutch says he hasn't seen or heard from Harvey. Now, look, I, I don't know why you should come after me just because I'm acquainted with the guy. All the information I got was in the newspapers there. I know a couple of months ago you wanted to talk to him for shooting up some guy on the docks. I know you couldn't find him. I know he was collared up in Boston after a stick-up. Some guy got killed there. I know he walked out of jail up there last week. I didn't hear from the guy. I didn't see him. I don't want to hear from him. He's too heavy for me. You get mixed up with a guy like that, it can lead to nothing but trouble. I I don't want any part of him. I don't blame you, Dutch. That's the truth now. I don't want any part of him. Guy is trigger happy. I got enough troubles of my own. I, I don't need his, too, you know. How much short time do you owe, Dutch? Uh, I owe them about 19 months. What was that on? Oh, it's still that same two and a half to five bit grand last name. It was hijacking a truck, wasn't it? Oh, there wasn't any hijacking involved in the first place. The driver wasn't stuck up at all. That trailer was just parked there on a lot. It was broken open. Some guys just broke it open. What do you mean, some guys? It was you, wasn't it? No. No, it wasn't me. Well, you pleaded guilty? Yeah. Well, I, I figured the cop out was the cheapest thing to do. I couldn't go argue with them. So I copped out for two and a half to five. I did 20 months. I still owe, I owe them 19 have you been seeing your parole officer regularly? Yeah, sure. I'm okay in that department. Been living up to your parole conditions in all respects? You bet you. All respect. I'm, I'm clean as a whistle. Been getting home by midnight? Every night. Now, it's, uh, it's uh, 10.30 now. You know, I, I'd be home by 11.15, 11.20 if I didn't stop to talk to you. You haven't been seeing any of the boys, have you? Oh, I told you. I, I don't run with that kind of crowd anymore. I'm a hard worker man. I got to be on that job 7.30 in the morning, yeah? How have you been as far as the drinking is concerned? Oh, now, listen. I, I, I stopped in here for one beer. You're not supposed to stop in for any. Yeah, but have a heart. You're but... supposed to abstain completely from intoxicating liquors. One beer, fellas. Now, listen. And you're supposed to walk right by bars, not go in them. Now, look, you, you, you're not going to make me go back and do that whole 19 months just for one beer, are you? you got to be reasonable at some point. It's not up to us to make you go back. I know, but you give a rum, uh, bad report to my parole officer, and I'm, I'm back up at Sing Sing, sitting out that 19 months. Oh, now, listen, fellas, be fair, will you? One lousy beer? <laughs> You're not going to hang a man over one beer. Now, you missed the point, Dutch. You're supposed to cooperate with police officers, not lie to them. Well, what do you mean, lie to them? I didn't lie to you. When? When, when, when did I lie to you? You told us you hadn't seen or heard from Harvey. Well, I didn't. What do you want from me? Just the truth, Dutch, that's all. I'm telling you the truth. I tell you what we'll do, Dutch. Look, all I'm asking you to do is be reasonable, huh? One lousy beer. I will take a ride over the station. Oh, house. fellas. We'll put it up it's to the, the lieutenant. It's the first time I've been in a bar since I got out. Well, looks like it's also going to be the last time. The two detectives, William Novak and John Fitzpatrick, took the parolee and known acquaintance of escaped killer Harvey Brider to their car and drove to the station house. There they parked, and at 10.51 p.m., they walked up the three stone steps into the muster room, past Lieutenant Snyder, who was desk officer, and Sergeant Collins, who was on switchboard duty, and into the back room where two division plain clothes men were questioning, prior to booking, a woman they had arrested on charges of disorderly conduct. They escorted Dutch up the rickety stairs to the second floor where the office of the 21st Detective Squad is located. Right over there, Dutch. I know. I know where to go. Okay. 
Listen, one lousy beer. Be reasonable. Huh? It's not the one beer, Dutch. It's the principle of the thing. What principle? Go ahead. Whitey? Yeah? Did the lieutenant get in? Yeah, he's in his office. I'll keep him here a minute, Fitz. Yeah. Federal case over one beer. No back, Lieutenant. Come in. I'm not doing a job for you in the morning. Yes, over. Now, listen, Lieutenant. Yeah? You know that Harvey Bryder that broke out of jail in Boston last week? The one that's also wanted here in a homicide charge? Yes, sir. And what about him? Now, Fitz and I picked up a friend of his in a bar over on Lexington Avenue. Yeah? There's a fellow named Dutch Sokin. He traveled around a lot with Harvey. You know where Harvey is? He says he doesn't, Lieutenant, but he hasn't given us a straight answer yet. What's going to make him give straight answers? He owes 19 months short time. Yeah? Uh, we collared him in a bar. He was having a drink. I think he's worried about that 19 months. Where is he? Fitz has got him outside. All right, bring him in. Yes, sir. Fitz! Yeah? Come on in. What does he owe this short time for? Grand larceny, Lieutenant. Right in there, Judge. Okay, yeah. Close the door, Novak. Yes, sir. Lieutenant King, Dutch Sokin. Sit down, Dutch. Hang me over one bottle, one beer. Sit down. All right. Where's Harvey? I told them. I told them I don't know. I haven't seen him. I haven't heard from him. What do you want from me? Dutch, these detectives told me you haven't given them a straight answer in an hour. Now, you've seen Harvey. Or you've heard from him, haven't you? No, sir. Where is he? I don't know. I told them I don't know. How many times they have to ask me? I don't know anything. I told him I don't want to run with that kind of guy anymore. He just means trouble. That's all, trouble. You owe 19 months short time, and they called you in a bar. I was having a beer. One beer, Lutzen. That's one too many. What's the name of your parole officer? Oh, now, look. Be reasonable, will you? Who's your parole officer? I don't want to go back to do that 19 months of a one beer. I ask you to be fair. Just be fair with me. We've been asking you to be fair with us, Dutch. Listen, can you forget about this if, if I see what I can do to help you out? I, I'm willing to trade, Lieutenant. I just want to be sure I'm on firm ground. Dutch, you've got a long way to go before you're on firm ground. Now, you help us. I promise I'll talk to the man. Where's Harvey? I don't know. That's not helping. I don't know. I, I, I only heard from him. When? Yesterday. I was hustling packing cases on the job. The foreman came over. He said there was an important telephone call for me. I went to the office. I got it. It was Harvey. Is he in New York? Yeah. Yeah, he's in New York. I told him, look, Harvey, you're too hot. I don't want anything to do with you. He said, I got to do him a favor. I said, I don't want to see you, Harvey. I don't want anything to do with you. He said, all he wanted to do was me to contact his girl. I should make arrangements for them to make a meet. Who's she? Her name's Dorothy, Dorothy Kirk. Where's she live? 372 East 80th. Did you contact her? Yeah. That's where I was tonight. I was there contacting. I was giving it a message. That's all. That's all I told him I would do. Only give it a message. That's all. I didn't want anything else to do with it. What was the message? Message was that uh, she was to call a certain telephone number at 10 o'clock. That's all. What telephone number? Pennsylvania 65599. Where's that? I don't know. I haven't any idea. He said she don't have a phone. He didn't want to risk going there. He just... Give me this number. He told me to have her call. That's all I know, Lieutenant. That's that's all I wanted to do with it. Okay. All right, now, look. I uh, I helped you out. You going to do something for me? I don't want to do that 19 months over one little beer. That's a long time. Yeah, I've been okay otherwise. I've been clean as a whistle. Yeah, Dutch. Maybe you have. Trouble is, there are all kinds of whistles... You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city. This is the second trial you've had since they accused you of a crime you didn't commit. As you sit there in the crowded courtroom, you know that there'll be another trial, and another and another if necessary, until finally the jury brings in a verdict of guilty. That's the way they want it. You wouldn't sign their phony confession. They can't pile up enough real evidence to make the charges stick. So this will go on and on until the jury is worn down, until that jury is ready to hang you rather than go through another trial. Well, there's a very good reason why you could never get in a spot like that. It's against the law, against the highest law of our land. 
You can't be placed in double jeopardy. You can't be tried again and again for the same offense where your life is at stake. The words that protect you against it are found in our Constitution, the fifth article of our Bill of Rights. Listen to what they say. No person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice placed in jeopardy of life or limb. That law goes clear back to the first Congress in 1789, City of New York. The group of men who gathered there to sign the Bill of Rights had you in mind. They were mindful of all the people and determined that the rights and freedoms of the people should never be ignored or denied. The Fifth Amendment is part of those rights. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Lieutenant King and his detectives interrogated Dutch for some time longer until they finally concluded that he knew no more than he had told them. In the meantime, the telephone number was checked out. It was a pay station in a bar and grill on 8th Avenue in the Times Square district. Lieutenant King sent detectives Howard and Vitale to the place. There was no sign of Harvey Brider. Neither the bartender nor three waitresses there remembered him, nor could they identify his photograph. One of them, however, recalled that the pay telephone did ring about 10 o'clock and that a man sitting at a nearby table walked into the booth to answer. At 10 minutes to 12, Lieutenant King and Detective Novak left the station house and drove to the address of Dorothy Kurt, 372 East 80th Street, given to them by Dutch. They parked down the street from the old four-story tenement building and got out of their car to meet Detectives Fitzpatrick and Scanlon, who had been sent to plant the building while the questioning of Dutch was in progress. Okay. Yes, sir. Fitz? Yes, sir. Here, Lieutenant. Hi, Fitz. No back? Where's Scanlon? Across the street there in the doorway to the cleaners. Oh, yeah. What'd you find out? I talked to the super. She lives in the second floor front, all right. Uh Uh-huh. She's got two rooms. She lives there alone. Did she have any visitors recently? Well, the super told me he hadn't noticed any. Do you know whether she's home? There was a light up there a little while ago. It was turned out about 11.30. Which window is it? Those two up there. Second floor, this side. Hmm. The super said the one towards this end of the building is in the living room. The other's in the bedroom. Okay, let's go. Yes, sir. Did you get any more out of Dutch? No, nothing. Well, I guess we don't need any more. Yeah. Front door is open. Okay, hold it. Signal Scanlon to move over to this side when we go in. Yes, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. Get the door. Yes, sir. Go on. Watch your step. She might have met him and brought him home. Yes, sir. She might have, yeah. Okay. Okay, go on. I'll do the talking. Yes, sir. <clears throat> In front there. Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'll have to get this fixed. Well, who is it? It's Dutch. Who? Dutch. Oh, hi. Yes, now we sound it. police officers. Listen. Where's Harvey? Is he here? Watch her, Fitz. He's not here. We'll take a look. He's not in there. Watch it. Kick the door open. Okay. That closet. You set? Yes, sir. How about the bathroom? Okay. There's the light. Push 
back the shower curtain. Yes, sir. There's nothing but laundry. Okay. Come on. Yes, sir. Think she knows where he is? We'll find out if she does. Standing in my bedroom like that. All right, just sit down. I told you he wasn't here. You could have believed me. Where is he? I don't know. You spoke to him at 10 o'clock. Who told you that, Dutch? Doesn't make any difference who told us. It'll make a difference to Dutch. Now, look, you're in big trouble. This guy Harvey is as hot as a $2 pistol for homicide. One here and one in Boston. Better stop thinking about him. Start thinking about yourself a little bit. I didn't do anything. You can't hurt me. You've hurt yourself enough already. I'm not kidding you. You're in big trouble. Where is he? I told you I don't know. What'd you talk about on the phone? I didn't say I talked to him. Dutch said that. Hmm. All right, Novak. I'm not getting any place here. Let's go. Come on, miss. Wait a minute. Where am I going? Where do you think? You've got no right to put me in jail. I didn't do anything. I didn't do a thing. You've been harboring a fugitive. I haven't been harboring anybody. I wouldn't be surprised if you helped him escape. What are you talking about? I didn't have anything to do with that. You can tell us all about it at the station house. Better put some comfortable clothes on and pack a few things to take with you. What do you mean, pack a few things? Well, you better take your toothbrush and toothpaste and anything else you think you might need in the next three or four days. Three or four days? If you're lucky. Now, wait a minute. I didn't do anything. I was just sitting here in New York minding my own business, that's all. You can't put me in jail for minding my own business. Can he? Well, Lieutenant, maybe she wants to help us. Maybe she's just scared of Harvey. You go in there with her, Novak. See that she gets those things together. Is that right? Are you just scared of him? Well, sure, I'm scared of him. I'm scared to death of him. He killed two people, didn't he? What do you want me to do, be not scared of him? Well, if you're scared of him, we're willing to help you. Is that right, Lieutenant? She wants it all one way. She wants help, but she doesn't want to give any. Let's go. We're wasting time around here. Better go in and get your things together, miss. Look, tell him I want to help him. I'll help him if I can. You better get your stuff together. You're not giving me a chance now. I told you I'd help you. All right. You want to help us? Tell me where Harvey is. I don't know. I really don't. Honestly, I swear it. Not right now. You spoke to him on the phone tonight, didn't you? Yeah, I spoke to him. Dutch brought a message here that I should call a number. I don't remember what it is. I got it written down. I got it written down over there. Never mind. We know it. Well, Dutch brought the number. He said I should call it. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock on the note. Well, I got no phone up here, so I went down to the candy store at ten o'clock and I made the call. It was Harvey. What did he want? Well, he asked me if I heard what happened to him. I told him I did. He said he was looking for a place to stay. He asked me if he could stay here, and I told him no, he couldn't stay here. I said that was out of the question. He said I had to help him because he was in a big jam and hot as a firecracker. He said I just had to help him. In what way did he want you to help him? Well, he said he needed money most. You see, when he was in New York before, he left $300 with me. He said he wanted it back. He asked me if I had it. I told him sure I had it. He said, all right, he'd meet me. Meet me tomorrow morning. Did you make a date? Yeah, I made a date with him. Tomorrow morning, 9.30. Where? He said I should be on the uptown platform at the 77th Street Station, the Lexington Avenue subway. He'd get off the train 9.30 tomorrow morning. You told him you were going to meet him? Yeah. I told him I was, but I wasn't. I was going to pack up and go to my sister's house tonight. Why? Well, to tell you the truth, I spent the $300. The girl, Dorothy Kirk, was taken to the station house by Lieutenant King and Detective Novak. Detective Scanlon and Fitzpatrick remained on a plant at the building in the event the fugitive showed up during the night. Lieutenant King notified Lieutenant Snyder, the desk officer on the job, and informed him that the subway station at Lexington Avenue and 77th Street would be the scene of considerable police activity in the morning. Lieutenant Snyder called me at my home at 4.30 a.m. and gave me a report of the situation. Immediately upon arrival at the station house, I signed the blotter and went upstairs to confer with Lieutenant King. At 8.30 a.m., detectives and uniformed officers began to man the posts assigned to them on the street and on the subway platform. At 8.50, it was decided to change plans slightly. A girl, Dorothy Kurt, would remain at the station house. It was planned originally that she stand on the platform where the fugitive could see her. This idea was abandoned as too dangerous for the girl. At five minutes after nine, I joined Lieutenant King at his post next to a bench near the center of the platform. We waited. By 9.20, the fugitive had not shown up. He hadn't come by 9.31. He was late. 
Here comes another train, I think, Captain. Ah, uh, it's an express, Matt. Yes, sir. Well, the local shouldn't be far behind. 32 minutes after, Captain. What? 32 minutes after nine. Yeah. Think he's going to show? Well, he'd better. After all our preparation. Yeah, but it still wouldn't surprise me if he was supposed to meet that girl some other time, some other place. Wait a minute. Here comes the local. Yes, sir. Looks like everybody's set. He's coming. You ought to be on this one. Seven cars. You see him, Captain? No. Nope. Way down there. Last car. That might be him. Novak made him. Come on. Heading this way. Go back! Watch out! Come on. Take cover, Captain. Get behind that scale. Right. Where is he? You see him? There he is! He's down at the end of the platform! There he is! Duck! Go back! Do you see him? He's over there behind that bench. The bench's down at the end. Keep your head down! Stay down there! Stay down over there! Stay down! Matt? Yes, sir? Watch yeah. him! He's ready for it! Get him! There he comes! Here he comes, Matt. You've got him! You've hit him! Hold it up! Hold it up! He's down! Come on, Captain. Keep those people back! Keep them out of here! Yes, we're okay, Captain! Bring in for an ambulance! You all right, Novak? Yes, Lieutenant, I'm okay. How does he look, Sergeant? He could be better, Captain. I think he's had it. He got off the train. I walked behind him. I called him to hold up. He turned on me, firing away. <sighs> Just when he didn't see the girl on the platform, he suspected something. Did one of you ring it for an ambulance? It's all taken care of, Sergeant. Well, this is one tough baby we won't have to worry about anymore, Captain. No, but don't be too hopeful, Matt. There'll be others. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Stole your what? Yeah. Oh. Well, where was this? 643? Where was it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, were the doors to the car locked? Well, how long were you away from the car? Yeah. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week... Every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Eric, Harold Stone, John Sylvester, Bill Zuckert, Ralph Camargo, and John Gibson. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.